Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started again. Welcome back for the second half of session one of 120C, 220C. Um, we talked about sort of the why, really why things like parametric design is so important and groundbreaking in terms of how we're approaching the whole design process and <laughs> how we think about creating these built environments. Yeah, and some of the hows, and then also some examples of uh, how the software works, what we're going to cover next. And just in terms of the hows, I'll put it all together into a more formal syllabus and put it on uh, Canvas for you. But basically, the way this course works is it's pretty much structured in terms of a series of different projects that we work on. Okay. What happens is for each of the different modules that we work on, there's a little mini project assignment that gives you a chance to sort of uh, kind of exercise some skills in that area. So it's going to be one of those for each of the different modules. And the deliverables are really scaled per the units that you're enrolled for. So if you're enrolled for two units, it'll be sort of a certain amount that it'll say do this much. If it's three units or four units, we try to scale it because different people take it for uh, like different number of units, just uh, going into more depth. So no one will miss out on anything. You know, it's just a really just how much you want to exercise and practice for the things independently. So in terms of what that actually means, if you go map it back to the roadmap, you'll see that for each of these different modules, for design of systems, for we're trying to do something that do a little bit of automation with Revit and smartly place components, there'll be one project there. There'll be one that's more about validating a model and doing some evaluating, just kind of uh, com computing some sort of uh, metrics about how well the model's performing and sort of pulling those values out. So the one that's explicitly just about design optimization, so kind of looking at different strategies for how you could go through and approach the AI, finding a better design solution. And finally, there'll be one that's all about just automating uh, design workflows. So that'll be the one that's really uh, all about how data is transferring back and forth between the different programs. So whether it's Revit to Excel, or we're actually going to be playing with a cool new tool in addition to uh, some of the other ones available called Flux.io, which is a kind of very new and interesting tool that promises to sort of really revolutionize the way we think about getting data between the programs. So we're always kind of playing around with new tools. But in general, it's all done through a series of different projects. Um, there is no testing, there's no final, there's none of that stuff. Okay. Um, unlike uh, B, which some of you have been in, it doesn't have one long project that follows all the way through. So this has the you know, thankful reset for, for every different uh, kind of section of the class. You can like, start on some other little thing and reset your expectations and like uh, start with something a little bit fresh. Okay. But you go both at the end of the class, you do one little self-designed project where you can design your own optimization. And really uh, kind of based on combining together whatever tools look the most interesting to you, you know, pull together something that you think is sort of an interesting example of optimization that you can share with someone else. So. It's all sort of little mini projects moving our way all through. Uh, it's two to four units. Most of you figured that out. The teaching team is me at this point, and we're trying to get ourselves lined up with some course assistants to help out with that. For viewing, you are always welcome to either be here live with us, or you can always watch the recordings online. The recordings always show up on YouTube, as well as we post them through Canvas and on Vimtopia. They sort of show up in a bunch of different places. So if you ever miss out on a class, or you got busy with another uh, commitment, or you have a regular commitment that sort of uh, conflicts, feel free to like, just kind of watch things as you go. And it just works out. We even have someone who's viewing from New York, just going to be following the whole uh, quarter remotely. And that, that's OK in terms of what's going on. They can still participate. Um, we tend to rely most heavily on Canvas as our way of communicating. So if you haven't checked uh, Canvas, uh, please check there. We have a course website there. We also have a site, Bimtopia, where I put a lot of things so that people who aren't part of the Stanford ecosystem can also get to the things we do. And we'll also use a system called A360. But don't worry about that just yet. The big one to know about today is Canvas. And if you go to Canvas even right now, you can get started just downloading some stuff. Oh, if you go to the 120C side and you go to Files, you'll see uh, there's a Session 1 folder. Just go ahead and uh, in the Session 1 folder, you'll find, uh, I always package things into little zip files full of uh, examples that we used during that day. Just go ahead and pull that down so you can work with it today. 
Um, is there anyone here who is not on that? Because I can add you in so you can access things. Okay, and let me just get you added in temporarily. And we'll see what's going on. Okay, what is your SUNET ID? Say it again. T S H A. T S H A. B A N I. B A N I. Okay. Okay, that part will get. Right. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Super. So you should be able to get to stuff today. You are in. <sighs> Just that easy. Great. So uh, you go to files to find what we need. Um, what we also tend to do here is just there is a calendar as part of this whole system where I kind of post all the different class sessions. So here on the 5th at 10.30, oh, right now it just has kind of the placeholder. I'll also go through and put links to the YouTube videos and links to the things that we downloaded in the calendar too. So you can find them a lot of different places. Okay. In terms of the software we're going to use on the logistics side, pretty straightforward. For the most part, we're going to be working with, as our modeling environment, Revit. Okay, and we're working with Revit 2016. If you don't have that yet, here's a URL where you can download it and install it on your machine for free. Um, it's on these machines, hopefully, if things are still set up okay in here. But we're going to tend to work with 2016. Uh, if you need any help downloading that, sometimes it's a little fussy downloading it to machines. I also have it on a thumb drive, so I can give you the thumb drive and give you the installer files. But if you have a machine and you have, can work, on your own independently of this lab. I always just recommend it because there's times when this, this room gets busy with people and other classes and you can't get in. So it gives you a level of uh, freedom to do that. We're also going to be playing around with another tool though called the Rhino, which a lot of people like to play with. Um, just another sort of geometric modeling environment. So we'll do each of those. Rhino does have a free student download, but it is available on these machines. Okay, so. Some people want to learn that, so we're going to head off in that direction too. In terms of the visual scripting environments, we're going to work with Dynamo, which is out of this school. It works with Revit. Right now it's up to version 0.9.0, I think it is, but it kind of keeps on changing. That's why I just put .x in there. We're also going to be working with Grasshopper. But in terms of Dynamo, you, where you need to download that and install that if you don't have it yet, is just dynamobim.org. Let me go out there and just kind of show you what that looks like. Go back to Priceline. No, I'll go back over here. If you go to dynamobim.org, you'll find there's a download button up here. There's a couple different places in there. It's really a big open source visual scripting environment, very much like Grasshopper. <clears throat> Trying to download. It's moving ever so slowly for me. I don't know why. Separate. Okay. Within this environment, go through and do Dynamo as opposed to Dynamo Studio. You can do either. Dynamo works within Revit. Dynamo Studio is uh, stands alone. Okay, but in general, this one will work better for what we're up to. Question? Oh, I was just saying, you get an alert. Oh no, I don't. That's interesting. It's probably something to do with just your, it, it should be a clean site. But it's, hmm, interesting one. Okay. Um, there is, we should look at that. <laughs> it's, it, it shouldn't be. So, what, does it say it's malware or what's it say? It just says the site ahead contains malware. Attacker is currently on dynamo.org. So it's dynamo Interesting. And it's, it's giving you the, the malware warning? That is strange. <laughs> Don't download it right now. Just yeah. hold tight and we'll take a look at that. That's a little odd. Okay. Um, if you have a Mac or a PC or if you need any help installing any of this stuff, I have a little bit of guidance for you out there. I think most people have already, if you've taken another class, know about some of the installation things. If you need any help in terms of getting stuff installed, out on Bimtopia, I currently have it set up for the global AEC students because there's a whole lot of them coming in very soon. 
but there's uh, information in there about computer requirements, how to set up and install Windows on a Mac, installing the Windows OS, configuring your virtual machine. There's, there's a lot of information out there just to help you get started. So if you need any help getting uh, either Revit or Dynamo set up on your machine, just go ahead and uh, ask us. Yeah, out here there's just lots of links and instructions about how to do different things. So take advantage of that. But for the most part, I think most, I mean, many people are already uh, kind of equipped and it's just a matter of, we'll, we'll help people fill in along the edges. <coughs> how about this for you guys? If you could, on your machines that are in front of you, open them up and let's take a look and see if uh, Dynamo is installed there. If it's not installed there, we will install it on your machine. So what you're gonna do is open up uh, Revit 2016. Actually, it would work under 2015 also. It's just I tend to have most of my example files are in 2016 now, so if you can, that'd be better. But what we're gonna do is open up Revit, and within Revit, go to the Add-ins tab, and under Add-ins, look to see if you see something that says Dynamo BIM, or Dynamo uh, 0.9. So I'll give you a chance. Nothing? Okay. No worries. We will go ahead and let me, let's kind of check with some of the other ones. If it's not in there, we will go ahead and get it installed. People are opening 2016. How are we doing over here? It's still opening, still opening. Where about? Went seven, a little older one. No worries. We'll do this together in just a second. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Oh, let's see how it's on your machine. Go to add-ins for a second. So 0.7, not to worry. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Let's see if this will work. Go ahead and go to the dynamobim.org site. Go to the download link. Download that file so that it actually is on your machine. I'm waiting for the site right now. What we're going to do is just install it on these machines so you have it available. Okay, I'm going to say download. It'll just copy a file on down to my hard drive. Probably put it inside the downloads folder. Once you have it in the downloads folder, we are ready to go ahead and install it. So let's see how you're doing in terms of just getting it copied down. So it's over there? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. I'm gonna go back over to Revit land. Actually, for this, let me close Revit. Just so. Uh, um, the, the news and What's it telling you? The news and the news, yeah. Okay. That's where we're going now, okay, excellent. You're good, so you already opened it, okay. For this, the ever popular administrative, how you install things on these machines, mm -hmm. is, I put it over here, only because my friends on camera, it's like that. Interesting. Let's see if that happens to anyone else. But it could, I want to say if it's sort of machine, machine specific, or let's see. Is that all lowercase? All lowercase. If, if you're having troubles, just go ahead and like log in out of that. There's, there's some sort of error happening in there. Well, how are we doing in here? I'm doing good? Yeah. Okay. Just say, yes, all that good stuff. Looks like you're installing. You're installing Revit too. Yeah. And no worries. <laughs> Got it. I see a lot of installation. On God cannot. <laughs> you got it, Andy, right? Yep. Dom, you're good? Claire, are you good? Let her rip. And after we do this, we probably have to re uh, uh, open Reddit. What's up, Ronnie? We'll just watch along longingly. <laughs> Okay, that'll work too. So, <laughs> take a 
take a snapshot and remember this somehow. <laughs> that, that installation password will come in handy at some point during the quarter, I guarantee. Okay, when you reopen Revit, hopefully you'll have something that looks like this, Dynamo point nine in your menu. Let's take a look at if that happens. Yep. Excellent. Okay, some things are working, that's good. We'll see you next time. Okay, what do we got here? Am I in the right version? Let's check that. <coughs> yep, okay. So I'll let you finish installing for a second. And we're gonna talk about Dynamo and how it works. Dynamo is actually, it's a really kind of cool environment. Oh, it's been years. Oh, a little reading the outside of that. It basically gives you a visual scripting environment. So if you've ever done any programming in CS106 or in kind of a very structured programming language class, it really in many ways works the same under the covers. It just presents itself as a series of nodes that connect together where underneath it all, whether it's Python or C Sharp is being executed, it's just kind of a, a visual scripting paradigm that works pretty well. And what we're gonna start by doing is this. We're gonna play around with this environment, just starting by doing some very simple things. We're just gonna play around in Dynamo a little bit. We'll look at the interface a little bit. We'll talk about numbers, create a little uh, geometry, and then ultimately talk about creating things that are in Revit. And I'll distinguish between two different environments. Geometry, which is what I'll call what happens inside the Dynamo window, it's the mathematical <coughs> space that doesn't involve real Revit elements. Okay. And then there's the Revit environment, okay? And what's interesting about those things is that you can often create things in this geometric space that then drive things that happen in the Revit space. But there really are two separate spaces. One's just a world of numbers and lines and boxes, or in Revit, it's a world of walls and elements and furniture and pieces like that. Okay. It's a little strange at first. But if we go ahead and open up Dynamo, It'll bring up an environment. A little window like this. For right now, I'm just gonna say new. Some people call these things that are gonna bring up sheets. Some people call them scripts. I've heard a lot of different words for these. I just call them maps. But it's basically something that looks like this. And this is the Dynamo environment. And let's just kind of talk about what's happening over here. In the dino environment, we're seeing a couple different things. You might see a grid that's kind of sitting down there on the ground plane and some X, Y, Z axes that are kind of hanging around. Over here on the left-hand side, this big browser full of a library of functions that we can use inside Dynamo. Okay, so let me pause right there and get to the point where you all have that too. So you got that little browser and everything going on? Yep. Excellent. What's gonna happen in this main window is twofold. We're gonna put nodes, nodes that have programming in them in this window, and beneath, in the background, geometry is gonna be updating to match what's going on in the nodes. It's a little bit confusing because you have the background view and you have the foreground view happening at the same time. But if you can tell which view you're working on, it's by this little widget up here in the right-hand corner. That'll show you whether you're working in the nodes, we call it graph, or we're working in the background. Okay, right now it's not gonna make too much difference, but you'll see in just a second. Okay, in terms of the interface, other things to know, you got the node map, you got the background view. When it comes time to work with numbers, there's a number of things we can do. Let's start with just, uh, just kind of creating some simple numbers. There are different sort of commands. There's a number command, Okay, there's a slider command. We can create arrays of numbers. But let's just start with some very basic stuff like that. So if, for example, you're over here and you type in number, input number, okay, this very uninteresting box, that's a node. You put a number in there, and what's gonna happen is that number is gonna get passed downstream. We go through and I will copy that just by control, control seeing it and paste it, or I can type it in again. I'll put another little number over here. Okay. Now we want to relate those two different numbers together. So what these two different numbers Okay, 
So the way this works is, you can think of it like plumbing. You pull the five and the 10 together into the plus, it's two different values over there. And then, you click this little guy down at the bottom, it'll preview what the result is, and the result is 15. That's how we program in Dynamo. It's pretty much just either wiring or plumbing, however you want to think about it, but things flow downstream is the way to think about it. So if these numbers over here change, for example, this becomes 15, you'll see that changes to 20. So it's kind of just keeping things together. Yeah, plus is sort of a very simple little construct to work with. You know, you might imagine some of the other basic arithmetic functions are there too. There's the multiply. I can pull the five and the 15 over there. And now that should have the result of that, 75. There are actually a couple of different nodes or modes what's going on here. Right now what's called automatic mode. And automatic mode is often a good one to be in. It sort of means that as soon as you do something, you'll see the result right away, which a lot of people like. If you start having very complicated maps, though, you might want to put them into manual mode, and then you have to click the run button to do the updating. So it just kind of depends how much math is going on in the background. Okay, so I got some different nodes here. Now, if we're just working with single numbers, that's kind of okay. Let me show you some other things you can do. Turns out number is such a basic thing. What you can do is almost just click in here, double click, I'll get something called a code block. A code block is the all-purpose, handy-dandy, like a Swiss Army knife of programming things available in Dynamo, because you can put almost anything in here. If you just type in a number <coughs> and put a semicolon after it, that's going to pass the value 4. You're going to see in just a minute, though, we're going to use that same code block to put together little formulas. Okay, So I can put numbers in as number. I can put them in as code blocks. Or a very popular way to put them in is to do this. You can type in something called a uh, slider. We'll type in slider because that'll work. I have number slider or integer slider. The difference being, do I want only to be integer values or do I want to be real values that are between? I'll go ahead and make it a number slider. Number sliders are kind of cool. If you pop down on the parameters, you can say what the minimum and maximum allowable would be and what the increment would be in between. So if I want a number somewhere between 0 and 10, essentially I'm sort of, you know, this is a variable, and I'm sort of putting uh, some constraints on it. Now as I pull this left and right, you'll see I can go anywhere from 10 to 0. But the nice thing is this number slider is also an input. So if I want to put that in as the input, in the multiplication operation. I can pull that. Now, notice as I'm pulling that, you might say, hey, it says four over here, it says uh, five over there, 75 doesn't look like the result of that. And the reason is, I have put myself into manual mode. So it's only gonna update that when I run it. Or if I put it back to automatic mode, It'll give us that result right away. Okay, so watch out for that. <clears throat> now, this little thing I keep on doing over here with these little boxes that I turn on and off, that's called previewing the result of the node. Every node carries a value with it. That previews. If you want to actually see those a little more explicitly so you don't have to keep on clicking that box every time, you can go ahead and put in a very cool node called the watch node. And what does the watch do? It just shows you the result. Okay, so that will make it very visible. So I can pull these things left or right, and I'm pulling them left or right. Okay. So numbers are pretty straightforward. Most people get numbers pretty easily. The next thing we often want to deal with, okay, I got one number, what about series numbers? And I actually sort of work with a bunch of numbers. So for example, if I didn't want to just go to and multiply one number, but I wanted to multiply one, two, three, four, and five by something, a whole series of numbers, I need to create a series. Let me show you what that looks like. 
there is a function available, it's called a sequence. Okay. Sequence will create a series of numbers. I can put in a start, so if I wanted to start at one, I'll show you a little kind of quickie here for when you want to create a number of numbers. This would output one. If I put the semicolon in there and then I type in another number, it'll actually make three different numbers. So it just sort of saves you some time. So if I put in one, the, oh, I'm going to put in like five of them, and the step is going to be four. How do you get the program? You just double click in space. So the start will be one. The amount will be five. Five values. The step is four. I'm expecting, and I always get this wrong somehow, I expect to see one, five, nine, something like that. Yeah. 13 and 17. Okay. So I can create a sequence like that. That's actually not too bad. <coughs> now, when you have a list of things like this, it's kind of interesting. If I, for example, feed my multiplication <coughs> operation a single number, when I feed it the single number five, it gives me a single result. If I feed my multiplication operation with a list of numbers, it will give me a list of results. So that's actually pretty handy. Let me show you how that works. I'll shove these over. So I got this sequence. I'll pull that in there instead. See, now I have that multiplied by each and every one of them. So sequences actually get you pretty handy when you like sequences. Now with sequences, there's a couple of different ways to do it. So I'm just going to show you some parallel ways to do it. The sequence function is always available. But this code block thing, this thing that I refer to as the Swiss Army knife with different uh, variables or different functionalities over here, is, can also be used to construct that. So let me show you what that looks like. If I want to have a sequence, I can say one dot dot. This how does it get this functionality right? I think it's going to be, let's try this. I'm going to go one to five dot dot. Four. Let's try that. That's one to five incrementing by four. Let me try that a little bit differently. <coughs> Let me try one to a hundred incrementing by four. Here's one to a hundred incrementing by four. So that's just another way of constructing the sequence. The result is the same. The result is still that list of output values. Okay. But let me show you the third variation on the theme. Oops. I'll go one to a hundred. I'll put the pound sign four in there. Any ideas what that's going to do? direction. <laughs> what it's going to do is this basically goes 1 to 100 increment by 4. When I say pound 4, that is make 4 increments out of it. Okay, so let's see if it does it. Interesting. Now, oddly, it didn't give me the 25. Because if we really make 4 increments, it's really dividing it into the thirds. So you always have to watch out for that. That's a little bit strange about, oh, so if I really want the 25, I need to make five of them in there. But even that's a little bit strange, because what you really need to go is zero to 100. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. It's just a lot of playing around. But these are all different little shortcuts for working things. But so far, we've just been creating a lot of numbers. And numbers are kind of OK, but you know, numbers only do so much for you. Um, we can add numbers, we can multiply numbers, we can divide numbers, we can do all sorts of stuff. Let me kind of show you another thing we can do to numbers, though. If I have something that I want to construct a more complex formula, what I can do is go through and, again, use a code block to do that. So what I can do is do something like this. I can just declare variables right here, first value 
times second value. These variable names I'm just making up as I go, divided by third value. And think of this as being Excel at this point. What we've done is we just actually declared three different variables. That means we're gonna have three different inputs and it's gonna do that operation on them. So when you evaluate this, it gives you three different inputs and it gives you an output. So I can say, great, let me take the first value, let me take the second value, and for my third value, I'll even put that little slider in there. Doesn't really matter what the inputs are. But since this is all values, the result so far is just gonna be a single value. <coughs> Let me hook up the watch to that so we can see what that node is delivering instead. Okay. If on the other hand, I fed it our series as opposed to feeding it in with uh, these individual values, maybe it's gonna happen. You get a whole series back out of it. So if I bring in that sequence, It'll feed those in sequentially. And it just kind of keeps these lists sort of paired up. So you have the list of items. And so you got the basic mechanics of like just how you do basic arithmetic with this. And that's kind of okay. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and think about how to make this a little more interesting. Because basic math is kind of okay, but you can also do some interesting things with sines and cosines, and we can start creating all sorts of interesting geometry. And this is kind of Oh, well, maybe we'll build this loop together next time in class to kind of put it out there in your mind and think about where this is useful. Okay, yeah. One of the, uh, a lot of folks here know, my, well, I'm a big fan of Frank Lloyd Wright's work. Okay, and one of his very interesting buildings is the Guggenheim in New York, which is a spiral. It's like a ziggurat, it's the inverted ziggurat. It spirals up, but it also kind of grows out at the same time. It's got an inverted spiral, something like that. And if you think about your modeling work in Revit or any building modeling tool right now, you might not, it'd be really hard to model something like that because all those little vertical lines that are moving around, you just have a really hard time trying to come up and do something like that. Yeah. What we can do, and I'll show you, is that we can actually use sine functions and a little bit of mathematics to determine a line, which would indicate where the coil would be that would zoom on up, and then use that to place a wall on it. And that's an example of what Dynamo is useful for, is you can basically create geometry, sort of simple lines and curves, and out of that, go through and place things like in real life. Okay, so to illustrate that, just to get you going, let's go ahead and close away my basic math. I've done enough of my basic math right now. Actually, what I'll do instead is just open up. I don't want to save my changes to that. We're gonna open up example 1.1 which is my little sine wave function. And here's an example of how I often sort of uh, put things together when I'm giving out to you. <coughs> this is another map, or graph as I like to call them. I just never got used to that word. Okay, and there's a bunch of different nodes in here, some of which are connected together, some of which aren't connected together yet. But let me kind of run you through just my basic logic to what I wanted to do here. What I'm going to do in this little example is create a little sine wave where I'm going to have some x values. Okay, so I'm going to have a little string of x values, a little sequence of x values. Okay, I'm going to have a y value. It's not a slider. It's supposed to be a value. There's only one value for all the different points. And okay, what we're going to do is actually go through and compute the z value. The z value we're going to compute by basically changing the x values in the degrees and computing the sine of that. Okay, so we get some little sine wave. Okay, and let's just kind of take a look at what that looks like. So it all starts with, okay, we got this little uh, create the x values here. Here I'm using the sequence function. Starting with one, I'm going up, what is it? 18 with an increment of one. That's kind of okay. However, I could also do it this way. Yeah, I have this, I could just write one to 18 to one. I could also go ahead and define some code blocks that really have it all spelled out in greater detail. Really, all of these things, you know, that first sequence function as well as all the ones in dark blue, they're really all gonna give you the same basic results. So you'll see what that's giving me is just a value, a string of values one to 18. I'll just make it one to 15 for now. Okay. 
it'll come back in, but all of these would assume to give you the same thing. So it's just different ways of getting at the same answer. Okay, so I have a bunch of x values. That is, if I have a bunch of x values, let's go ahead and set the y value. The y value right now is at 7.1 for some reason. I'll just leave that at zero for now. Okay. Let's try this. Let's try taking the x values and the y values and putting together as points. So there's a very nice node called point by coordinates, which takes an x and a y, and we'll put some points out there. And if you go dragging your x values and your y value, it'll pop them in there. Now notice, as soon as I put the x values in, the points actually showed up in the background. I'm not sure if you saw that. Let me kind of pop that y back off again. The reason is y and z are going to default to 0. If nothing's in there, they're just going to fill themselves in with 0. Okay, so I can put that y in there and it doesn't make much of a change. But if I drag my little slider, you'll see those y points start moving into the background. Yeah, I see those both worksheet check worksheet. I don't see that. You see. Oh, that's interesting. Um, go to the background view. Orbiting it around. Go to this guy here. That's interesting. I don't know what's going on. Again, this machine seems really strange in terms of what's going on. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, you have it. You got it? I think I can do it. Okay, no worries. It's just the previous little funky for you. Okay, excellent. So we got these points, they're kind of hanging around. Let's just kind of keep on going in terms of what can happen. What happens is the background is, the points are in the background here. I can switch to background mode by clicking the widget up there. I can pan those around if I want to. I can zoom on in, move that over a little bit. But the background mode is really operating independently. Oh, pan is this guy right here. Or if you happen to have a button, a mouse wheel, you can uh, push down. Middle button. Middle button. I'm going to do that. You can orbit it. I think up to shift. Is it a control? I can't figure out orbits. I'll figure it out yet. It's there. It's just in a really weird orientation. Oh, that's, no, you know, I think they've changed that. That used to work differently. Because now I'm orbiting. Okay, I'm going to go back to panning. It's weird that it has a sense of perspective. I'm not used to having that. Okay, go back to the notes. But they're kind of hanging in the background. We'll play with that some more. So I got some points. That list of points is kind of okay, but it's not all that interesting because the Z's are all assumed to be zero. So what we're doing in the bottom part of the graph is we're basically taking those x values and for every x value saying if that were radians, what would the degree value be? And then multiplying or computing what the sign would be. Okay. Let me go ahead and I'll just change that down to one for right now. And I'm going to connect those in as my z values. Not too awfully bad looking. This value, whenever we're starting to do math and we're playing around with signs, I often kind of keep around, I'll label it as amplification, is really just going to either amplify or diminish really what the effect of the sign value is. So if I want to have a stronger kind of curve, I can give it an amplification, I can pull it back and make it less amplified. But that's an example of really quickly, you know, this could be a whole series of different buildings that are following these different heights or something that's coming out of that. And just with this slider, I'm able to very quickly kind of go through and change that geometry. Okay, so, so far so good. Most of you have a series of points floating around out there in the background. Excellent. The back end of this script is pretty straightforward. We are going to either plot this as a series of line segments or put a curve on them, but if you have a whole bunch of points, and you can take a look at the points. Actually, if I just look at the values, these are the z values, and 
these are the points, the x, y, z's that are coming out of it. If I take those, I can either plot them as a series of line segments, It's kind of a funny construct, but it'll make, oh, just kind of a curvy or a series of straight lines. What this is doing is saying always start at the first point and start the next one and with the rest of the items, which starts at the second point, which is kind of a weird way of ultimately getting, you're breaking a single lift down into a whole bunch of series of segments. Okay, but that almost is kind of a little bit stranger, so I'm going to turn that off because I think that I like it even better if I just do it as a curb. So there's a NURBS curve by points, and that gives us a nice smooth looking curve over there. If you copy um, two, how do you get that curve? If you have what? This height. Oh, that guy. Um, great question, let's try escaping our way out of it. Just escape oh, it. Right. No worries. Okay, so you got some points. Let's see if you get some curves blown around out there. Excellent. Slide that slider. Looking good. Looking good. Looking good back here. Excellent. Okay. That's kind of it. That's really what we end up doing with Dynamo. So we do very simple things like this just in terms of kind of math, kind of getting going and doing that. Let me kind of show you one that's somewhat similar. We can create some geometry. In my examples down here, sine curve does that. Let me kind of show you something a little bit different. We're going to go through and look at something called the attractor logic and think about how we can use kind of a pretty standard kind of programming construct to go through and do something a little more dynamic. Okay. The attractor is really based on this as a, a kind of a programming construct. It says that basically. Based upon how close I am to you, you're going to respond. So if it would be that I get really close, it makes you get bigger, it makes you get smaller, it changes your color. So it just sort of helps you understand, yeah, as we're near each other, the attraction force actually has some sort of an impact on the object. Okay. And this next example sort of uses that. So what we're going to do is actually take a point and have another point, and based upon how close the two points are together, kind of a circle or a sphere is going to go ahead and make itself bigger or smaller in response. So go ahead and open up example 1.2, and we'll take a look at that. one works is you can see I am again creating a point by coordinates. I have a point looks like it's currently at zero zero. Okay. I have an attractor point which I'm going to slide around with these slides and using these sliders over here. Okay. And based upon those, okay, it's going to go through and ultimately uh, do something out here, you know, by computing the distance between those two <coughs> points. So if my target point kind of connect that in there. I'll let that be the geometry. One of the things I'm bringing together. And I want to compute the distance to some other thing. So what I'm going to do is use distance to this tractor point. Okay, so if I look at this value, Right now, those two things are about 2.05 apart. Let me put a little watch on there just so you can actually see the values as it changes. Okay, But if I move the attractor, I move these sliders around, you'll see the distance between them is going to change. You can actually even see over here the points are moving around a little bit in space. Actually, even here, let me take out the other points so it's clear that you can see what's going on. I'll take out these points. So that one point is an attractor. Yeah, the, the zero, zero point is what I'm calling the target. This other guy over here is the attractor. So if I move him closer in, the distance is less. If I move him further out, the distance is more. Okay. Then I've got to decide what I want to do with that distance. 
What I'm doing is I'm going to go through and take that distance and really define a circle that has the center point at the target and has a radius that's based on that distance, a radius based on that distance. Okay, so I'm going to take my little target point right over here at the center point. For the radius, I get to decide what I want to do, and you can have all sorts of fun deciding whether you want the circle to get bigger or smaller based on whether you're going to divide the distance, put one over the distance. Turns out one over the distance is kind of the more interesting ones. If I make the radius based on that, you'll see what happens is as the attractor gets, or gets closer, the radius gets bigger. Well, that's just really affecting how strong the effect is. For example, go ahead and put an effector of like 10, and you'll see what's happening is it's basically just multiplying the size of the radius. Or in this case, what's doing is taking the distance and dividing the factor divided by the distance. It just sort of, it, it's determining how big the circle is. So if I get far away, it gets very small. If you get very close, it gets very big. Okay, and this is a good for all. So we can have atomic models, and as things get close to each other, you know, things get bigger because the gravitational force is bigger, or you know, turn to different color, kind of like a heat map to show you where things are more interesting. You know, we can do all this kind of in geometry space, and geometry space works pretty well for this. And we can decide whether, and it really depends on whether we divide or we multiply or one over any of those things will get a different behavior to really how this attractor affects that guy over there. <coughs> now, we've been doing it so far just with a single point, but it turns out it would actually work with a whole series of points too. So let's show you what that would look like. If as opposed to just being a single target point, we had a grid of target points, then we can compute the distance to all of those and draw those circles. And let me show you what that would look like. In this case, I'm going to take a series that goes from 1 to 10 and feed it in as x and y values. And that's going to create a grid of points. If I feed in that grid as the target points, okay, I'm also going to go through and feed in the grid as the center point. So let's see what this does. I'll make that a little bit smaller, because right now it's so big, it's hard to tell. They're all overlapping each other. So now, as I go moving my little attractor around, How do you make it smaller? Say again? Scaling oh, factor. I just, uh, the scaling factor. Reduce it from 10 back down to two or something like that. So as you go moving, grid around, or the uh, attractor point around. <coughs> Slide it back on the X a little bit. Oh, make you back up to four. You'll start seeing that this starts impacting like just the size of all those things as things get close or get far away. And we're pretty much going to leave it for there today, but let me show you where this starts to get to be useful. So that's a preview of the coming attraction. Okay. Here we are. You can actually sort of see them showing up in Revit, too. But if I go through and open up, one point four, which says, OK, this geometric space is kind of interesting. It's nice to draw circles in space, but what if I actually wanted to go through and affect something in Revit? If I open up the Revit view, what you'll see is I have a whole lot of blocks which might represent different buildings on a city grid or something like that. And if I open up the Dynamo, and again, we'll do this together next time. I just want to sort of, for people who want to play along and see where this is going, give you a chance. <clears throat> Where did my dynamo go? You still open the background. Where are you? I know they're there.
That's weird. Got a little Windows 10 weirdness going on. So, there we go. What we can do is doing something very similar. Not sure. Interesting. Oh, I won't leave it. I'll leave it off. We'll do it next time. <coughs> we can, if you open up the script associated with this one, you'll see we can use that same notion of moving the attractor point around within this grid of elements, okay, and then have these elements start resizing themselves, whether it's the height and width or the volume, just whatever we want to have set based on that, we can have them responding to. Okay. And when we do that, we're gonna start seeing how this world of math, which connects to this world of geometry, ultimately drives the world of Revit. And that's where we're heading. Okay, so let us adjourn there for today. Let's go ahead and just kind of pause, take it all in. If you get a chance, please install uh, Revit 2016 and uh, Dynamo on your own computers. You can work on that at your own. Um, the examples will always be, again, be up online, both on coursework, as well, or on Canvas, excuse me, as well as on uh, Bimtopia and stuff like that, as well as the video. So feel free to play along because I think you probably get the sense that, hey, this stuff isn't so bad. If you kind of enjoy doing this, it's kind of fun just to sort of play around and start tweaking things and uh, you know, see that it actually gives you an awful lot of power for you know, not too much programming overhead. And that was really the whole idea behind the visual programming languages. Can we make the programming and the automation easy enough so that we can focus on the optimization problem, not on the programming mechanics? Okay, cool. Let us adjourn for today.